Thank you, Jesus, for wearing my crown. Thank you for loving us. We pray now that you would pierce our minds with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. How are you doing? You doing good? Is there anybody here who's hungry? Anybody? You're hungry? Okay, after church, we're going we're gonna to make that happen with this dinner. And uh, is anyone here who's, who's depressed? Anyone discouraged? Anyone mad? <laughs> that's okay, because that's a part of life. Get over it. <laughs> because Jesus is coming again. So all them little things we don't need to be worrying about right now. We got other things that we need to be doing, right? Yes. Now... Today's subject is, dear saints of the Most High, you don't mind me calling you that, right? Are you saints? Yeah. All right. So, dear saints of the Most High, we're going to be talking about some things that we need to always consider and keep in our minds. On the back of your bulletin are all the resources of everything that we're going to be talking about today. So, when you go home, you can read. Read these things, what the Lord says we need to read. We need to know what's going to be happening on this earth before Jesus comes so that we can be prepared, right? If you're riding down the street in your car and someone calls and says, there's an accident down the road, the road's blocked off. If you keep going, you're going to be in that accident and you'll maybe killed. What would you do? Well, you'd go another way, wouldn't you? So we, we want to thank the Lord for telling us what these things are going to be on this earth so that we can be prepared. Now, on this accident, we couldn't avoid, we, the accident still is going to happen. These things are still going to happen on this earth, but we do not have to be a victim because God says that I will deliver everyone out of any type of trouble on this earth if your name is written where? in the book of life. Now, when I spoke last time on the first phase of the judgment, when Jesus changed clothes, uh, we went through the first phase of what he's doing in the most holy place and all of that. Some of you were not here. We are going to do a quick review of what we went through in March so that everybody can be on the same page. Is that okay? Now, you see, I got my J-Mac students here, so I'm going to be talking to you guys like your J-Mac students because the Lord says that when you talk to his people, you got to be clear. Every must, must, everyone must understand it from a child all the way up, okay? We, it does us no good if we're talking about things over everybody's head. So you're going to be the J-Mac students today, okay? Are you okay with that? We're going to do a quick review of what we went over before. Now, I'm hoping that they told me I need to turn this on. Is it, uh, is it on for me? So do I need to turn it up? Mm-hmm. Okay. So we're going to do a quick review of what we went through last time. And for some reason, this is not... Is it, is it okay? <laughs> I, I don't have any technology skills. God has given to people different types of things. Not this one for me. I'm going to go this way, correct? Yes. Thank you. Okay, don't leave me. <laughs> Is it on, Pastor? Yeah, it's on. I think they said pull it up. You pulled it down. It's on. It's on now. It's on now. It's on now. First one. Oh, I, I was going the wrong way. I'm so sorry. Anyway, that's a small thing, as long as we can get through it. Anyway, we're going to do a quick review. Now, when I say quick, follow along with me because we're just going over some things that we did before. I want to bring everybody up to the same page. So, in March, we talked about um, what Jesus did in the holy place. When he was crucified, he went to the holy place for 16 hours centuries, uh, 18 centuries, 1,210 years. And there he was there taking our prayers, forgiving our sins. He was doing everything until 
1844, and he moved from the holy place to the most holy place. How do you know he did that in 1844? We looked at that long timeline, 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So we just simply said, like the Bible says, if you just calculate, the timeline started in 457 BC, it went to 8020. Uh, 7, AD 31, AD 34, that was 490 years. Subtract that from 2,300, you get 1,810 years left. Add it together, 1,810 plus 490 is, brings you to 1844. Now, so Jesus moved into the most holy place in 1844. What was he doing there? Adding names in the book of life, removing names out of the book of life. He was dealing only with those Christians or people who had called upon his name, looking to see, and he knows already, so the books are really for uh, other people and angels. He knows already whether we're gonna, our name is gonna remain in the book of life. So that's a work of judgment that he was doing that started in 1844 starting with everyone since Adam and Eve. That's a lot of people. And he had been doing that for 174 years, starting with the house of God. So we know that he started judging those who are in Christ or in the grave first. Then he's going to move on to the Christians who are alive. We don't know when that's going to be. We don't need to be worrying about when that's going to be. We need to be worrying about making sure that when he comes to my name, that we are fit to be saved. Because if he took anybody to heaven that was not fit to be saved, then sin would rise up again. But he said sin won't rise up again, so we don't need to worry about that either, do we? How does, how does the judgment work? Everything we've done, everything we do, even our thoughts are written down in books. And the Bible talks about the statute book, which is the Bible, the book of life, the book of remembrance, the book of death. We talked about different, well, and how did it get there? By a recording angel. The recording angel even writes down our thoughts, everything we do, everywhere we go. So there's nothing that we can do that nobody knows about. Now, right now, nobody knows about the, these things but the Lord, but there's going to be a time when it's going to be open to everyone. Our words, our actions, our motives, our thoughts, everything is written down. And what's in the book of life, we said? The, the Bible says all the people's names who are going to heaven. Very simple. Are you with me so far? I'm going kind of fast because I'm reviewing, okay? All right, the book of remembrance, all the things that you've ever done good is recorded. That's a good thing. Yay! Book of sins. Bad things. Boo. Okay? So, but that's not a, I mean, if, if it was in there, it don't have to stay. That's what Jesus is doing in the most holy place. If you've repented, and when repentance means stop doing it, because Lucifer repented. I mean, Lucifer said he was sorry. Uh, Judas said he was sorry. We can say we're sorry, but unless we forsake and stop doing it, it means no good. The standard of judgment is God's holy ten commandments. It's saying, are we keeping his commandments? All of them. Not just nine, not just three, not just two. And we talked about all you have to do is so simple. It is so simple to be saved. Because if you do something wrong and you know you weren't supposed to do it, even if you didn't know you weren't supposed to do it, but you find out, you just ask Jesus to forgive you. If you're sincere, he'll do that, and he will write pardon by your name. So everything that you've ever done wrong needs to have pardon rent by it. Pardon, 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 pardon. If you do everything but one, it will erase every last one of them. And it is so easy because all you have to do is love him enough to obey him. You know, uh, I was talking to someone and, and, and they were just saying, oh, I'm just trying so hard. I just keep doing these things over and over. I just can't seem to stop. I said, well, you'll stop when you fall in love with Jesus. She person got offended. What you getting mad at me for? I'm the one, I didn't say if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Jesus said that. Uh-oh, what did I do? Was that me? Okay, all right, thank you. Whew. <laughs> but, I mean, but he does have a plan B because the Holy Spirit will bring things to your remembrance, correct? 
All right then. So then we're talking about when Jesus is up there pleading for us, what is Satan doing? You remember that thing we read? What, this is actually what Satan said. I can't read it right now. If you're a speed reader, you can probably get through it. But anyway, Satan is accusing us and he had a pretty good case. But all Jesus has to do is show his, the prince in his hands and show they, this person forsake their sin. They love me. They're obedient. And I died for them. So you need to back up. And while the uh, first phase of the judgment, while Jesus is in the most holy place, these are the things that we need to be doing. We really need to be confessing our sins, drawing nearer and nearer, as close as Jesus as we can possibly be every single day, resisting the devil every single day. And stop if, if, if we're one of those people saying, well, God knows my heart. He know I'm struggling. He know I can't get over this. He know I can't get over that. What he knows is that he's given us every power, every means to forsake every sin. And what he knows is if it's not done, then he will not be coming for you or me to take us to heaven. We can overcome any sin on this earth through Jesus if we want to. And we're told that if we just sit still and stop fighting with God, everybody would just, just be saved. But we know that the whole world will not be. So we just need to remember what we said last time when, when we spoke, that our name must be in the book of life if we're going to be saved. So just keep your name in there by studying, by praying, by doing things, by obedience. When you study, then you fall in love with Jesus. That's the only way to fall in love with him. You can't fall in love with him by just doing a group Bible study every now and then. You can't fall in love with him by just reading your, your lesson in, for Sabbath school, just so you can in, give input. You fall in love with a daily walk with Jesus, and you grow and you grow, and you fall in love with him where you would rather die than sin against God. And this is how we're going to have to be, that we would rather die than do anything that would offend them. And now, saints of the Most High, we're going to talk about five things that will be going on right before Jesus leaves the most holy place. This is very important. We need to pay attention to these things. Now, when you go home, once again, you have your resources. Read the great controversy. Read it in last day events. Read your Bible first, because you got all your Bible text, and then read your other additional books that are also inspired that the God has given us to read. Put everything together, because the Lord said, if we would have just read the Bible and heeded to everything, we probably wouldn't need those other books called The Great Controversy and Last Day Events and Desire of Ages. But because we didn't, he has to give us what we need. So is there anything wrong with that? The Bible is the great light. The spirit of prophecy is a lesser light. And that light is reflecting from the great light. And if God says we need both, we need both. We're going to look at five things. Number one, right before Jesus leaves the most holy place, the judgment then moves to the Christians who are alive. Do we know when that's going to be? Do we know? No. And it's a good thing because if we knew when, when it was going to be, we'd say, I just waited for the night before and try to get myself together. We don't know when it's, uh, he's, the judgment is gonna start with the Christians who are alive. So that says, it's very simple. Common sense says, live as if you know he's coming to your name today. Live that way. And then you don't have to be worrying about it. And don't be worrying about, oh, I wonder if the Lord's coming to my name. Oh, let me see, uh, 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 uh. All you got to do is fall in love with Jesus through study and through prayer, being kind. Do, you know what to do. Do those things that draw you closer to him. And then you won't have to worry about anything else. Number two, something else that's going to happen before Jesus leaves the most holy place, dear saints, is the latter rain will fall on this earth on God's people. Now let me try to quickly explain the latter rain. 
The Holy Spirit compares itself or likens itself to rain. You got the former rain, you got the latter rain. So picture literally, the former rain when you're planting your garden. You need the rain. It makes, it germinates that seed. And then when, it's, when it grows and it's time to harvest, it's the latter rain. Spiritually, that is the, the um, former rain is conversion. The latter rain is a daily walk with Christ. Back in history, literally in AD 31, the former rain was Pentecost, the opening of the gospel. Jesus had just risen from the grave. Many people did not know that. They thought he was still dead. The Holy Spirit had to, get, had to go in everybody's minds of the disciples and the apostles so they could preach to the world that Jesus has risen. And they did that in their own language, but everybody heard in their own language. Now the latter rain, we're told, is going to be more abundant than that. The Holy Spirit will follow us, give us more power than even that. Back then, 3,000 people were converted in a day. So we're talking before he leaves the most holy place, that power is going to come again on God's people. The question is, is it going to fall on me? Is it going to fall on you? Well, it will fall. I really can't hardly read that, and I want to read that to you. So I'm going to turn to that because I can't, I, my eyes aren't good, but when I go to heaven, I won't have that problem. So, it will, the, whole, the latter rain will fall on you if you have repented, if you're already doing something. Don't think that you can just sit there and say, okay, I know there's going to come a time when the latter rain is going to fall and I'm going to get power and I'm going to go around and do all this witnessing. No, 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 no. You got to be doing something now and it doesn't matter what it is. As long as you're doing something that's going to uplift Christ, you're gonna, your light has got to shine somewhere to somebody and not just around you. Okay. The latter rain is because, and it also states that the latter rain gives power to the third angel's message. What is the third angel's message? Somebody just kind of started off. If any man, it is the third angel's message, worshiping of the beast. We're going to talk about that a little later down in the sermon. So when it says it's going to give power to the third angel's message, the God's people is going to go around preaching the gospel more fully about the Sabbath. Okay? We're going to talk about that a little more. But we have to be prepared to receive the latter rain. Number three. The United States, our land of the free, our beautiful waves of grain is going to turn into a persecuting power. Once again, we don't have time to give you everything that's on these things because there's 12 things, which really should take me 12 hours, but will only take me 30 minutes. Okay? So we're, what we're doing today is wetting our appetite so we can go home and read these things for ourselves, and that the Holy Spirit pierce our mind so we can get a good understanding. You got it? Because this is not the Sermon on the Mount. I don't have food to feed you two and three times a day for you to be here. Go home, read what you're supposed to read. You got it? United States. Once again, you have all your text there. The United States is going to do some strange things. Now, first, before we go any further, I want to simply explain the beast. In Revelation 13, when, the United, when it says that the United States will cause all to worship the first beast, it will make an image to the first beast. That first beast is Revelation 13, 1 to 10, the papacy. What then is the papacy? Simply, for J. Mac students, the Roman Catholic Church will employ the government, secular power, to enforce rules, and all those rules are always against God. There is only one law in the Ten Commandments that they're saying is against God. Which one is it that they took out? The what? The Fourth Commandment. So when the church 
employs the state government to enforce rules, then it becomes the papacy. So when it says the United States is going to make an image to the first beast, they're making an image to? Yes. And it's going to cause both great and small, rich and poor, free and bond, to worship the first beast. They won't be able to buy. They won't be able to sell. So this is just a little. I'm whetting your appetite of what the United States will do. Please go home whenever, at your leisure. Read this stuff in the great controversy, in the testimonies, in the last day events, and in Maranatha. I think you're doing that last day events at prayer meeting. Am I not right? Wonderful. So you're going to easily come upon this on what the United States will do. We just explained the papacy, are you clear on it? It's very simple. So what the United States will do, they'll do the same thing. But they're gonna do it with the Protestant churches. We're a Protestant church, right? What is a Protestant church? You know what that is? Huh? Protesting against what? Okay, good, 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 good. So I don't have to go into that. So this time, the United States, they're going to combine the Protestant churches with the government to enforce laws against all of us. And we know what that's going to be. They're going to force us to go against our conscience to work a spurious Sabbath, a false Sabbath, the first day of the week. And if you do not do it, you'll be punished. We have a decision to make. But we don't need to, we can't make it then, we need to make it now. You got it? Then read number four, the little time of trouble. Look around you. Look at what's going on. You know we're in the little time of trouble. Why they call it the little time of trouble? Because God is still, has the angels holding back the fullness of human passion. It doesn't look like it sometimes with all these school shootings and all these uh, uh, all this stuff that's going around, the Bible says uh, men are being transformed into demons. It looks like it's the great time of trouble, but it's the little time of trouble. Now, what happens in the little time of trouble is that Sunday blue law. I looked it up, and I tried to find out why is it called Sunday blue law. No one really knows. They speculate and say because it was written on blue paper. Mm, could be, but is that important? No, so I'm not going to worry about it. So, the laws must first be on the books, and we know that that is happening. There was a senator I was looking at on YouTube. That law is on the book that we must. If we want to uh, preserve this land of where everybody's, you know, of liberty, if we want to stop the crime, if we want to stop the bloodshed, everybody needs to go to church. I don't have a problem with that. The problem is you can't force people to go to church on a particular day, especially if it's a man-made day. Uh, in, in the tithes of offering, Chase has said, the Sabbath is the day that God sanctified and set apart. It is the only law that's in controversy. No one's going around saying we're going to put them in jail if they lie. We're going to put you in jail if you don't honor your mother and father. I mean, if you kill them, you know. But uh, number five, God's people, before he leaves the most holy place, will be sealed. First, we got to determine what is the seal. A seal is always attached to a law. And the seal has three things. It'll tell you the name, it'll tell you the title, and it'll tell you the territory of the lawgiver. So the name, we know that the seal, and the Bible says, there's text for you to check, is the Sabbath. Why? Very clear. The name is God. The title, creator. The... Um, What's the other one? The territory, heaven and earth. It's the only seal that's attached to a law. If you try to get rid of that, of that seal, you've gotten rid of the fourth commandment, but you can't get rid of the fourth commandment because God made it. People may think to try to change it, and, you, and people may, the whole world may say, oh, the first day is the Sabbath. Did God say that? He did not. So therefore, we go by what God says and not what man says. God's people, before they leave, will be sealed on their forehead. Why the forehead? This is your frontal lobe. This is how you, where your thinking mechanism starts from. So we're going to be sealed in our mind. You'll also receive another mark, the seal of God, or the mark of the beast. 
we, just, we did talk briefly, the mark of the beast, we're talking about the papacy. You're either going to get the seal of God or the mark of the beast. Which seal do you want? You want the seal of God. Now, it talks about the mark of the beast. If you get that mark, it's also in your forehead, meaning the same thing. I believe it. This is what it is. I'm going to do it because this is what I believe. Regardless, if that mark is in your hand, that also means I'm afraid for my life. Therefore, I'm going to go ahead and do what the state says. I'm going to go to church on Sunday. It also means for those people who are coming to the Ypsilanti Seventh-day Adventist Church or the Lansing Seventh-day Adventist Church or any Seventh-day Adventist church on this earth, if you go to church every Sabbath, yet you are still trampling on God's holy commandment for things such as, "Hmm, I don't feel like cooking during the six days, so maybe I'll do it on the Sabbath. Hmm, I don't feel like cooking today, so maybe I just go on out to a restaurant. I'm a little tired, so I'm just going to just clean up on the Sabbath. It doesn't matter. If it doesn't matter to you now, do you think it's going to matter when you're forced to do it with your life? No, it will not. So God says, prepare now, not to receive the mark of the beast, but to receive the seal of God. Okay? And now, saints, and now we're going to do a few things that's going to happen when Jesus leaves the most holy place. Everything we've talked about so far, he was still in the most holy place. But now we're going to talk about what happens when he leaves. Once again, dear saints, we don't know when he's leaving. We don't know when the latter rain's coming. We don't know when we're going to get sealed. We don't know when Jesus is coming, and we don't need to know. But the Lord says, These things are going to happen. Just prepare. I just want you to prepare. So we're going to look at seven things that will be going on right after Jesus leaves the most holy place. Number one, when he leaves the most holy place, we're told that he lingers outside of the most holy place. And there's a tinkling sound coming from, you know, he has a palm and a granite, you know, the bottom of his garment. And then darkness covers the earth. We're talking spiritual darkness because probation has closed. This is why the Lord says, let's get ourselves together now before probation closes. When probation closes, there's no more mercy for the impenitent, none. Okay? So probation will have closed. Our names will be in the book of life or not. His kingdom will be set up when probation closes. Number two, the Holy Spirit, we're told, we be, will be withdrawn from this earth at that time. Right now, we're living And all this chaos and all this crime, but the Holy Spirit is still here. The Holy Spirit is still working on people's minds. Praise God for whom all blessings flow. This is why the Lord says, get yourself together. We need to pray every single day for the Holy Spirit. Do you do that? Pray for him because the Holy Spirit at this time, if it's going to be withdrawn from the earth, where's the Holy Spirit going to be? Huh? In you. So when it's withdrawn from the earth, it will be in you. You got that? Let me back up a minute before I go any further. One thing that I forgot to mention, while Jesus is still in the most holy place, and we were talking about the sealing, there's some God's people that's going to be sealed, that's going to go through what we haven't talked about yet, the great time of trouble. So he's going to do a sealing of of God's people, and it's only going to be 144,000. Don't get bent up all the shape about that number because we're not talking about the great multitude that's going to be saved. We're not talking about that. We're talking about God has a little flock that he's going to use and choose to go through the great time of trouble just like he did Job. There was no reason for the Lord to say, test Job, other than that Satan kept saying that we only serve him because of blessings. 
that we don't really love him. Jesus says, I'm going to show you 144,000 people who's going to serve me through the worst time that has ever been such a nation, and they will not deny me. So he's bragging on us. Isn't it good to be bragged on? Especially by God. Actually, the only people we need to brag on is God. So we're back here where the Holy Spirit is being withdrawn from the earth. Satan has complete control over those who, are, who don't love God. We can't imagine anything like that. The only thing we know is that, <laughs> that it's going to be worse than the destruction of Jerusalem. If you've read about the destruction of Jerusalem, you'll say, how can it possibly be any worse than that? But the Lord knows what he's doing because he keeps telling us, but I have a people that I will deliver out of that time of trouble if their name is written on the book of life. During that time, also, when he has left the most holy place, that's when the Sunday law is enforced. Before then, saints, the Sunday law was just on the books, and it was turned into a law. It means nothing unless they try to enforce the law. So during that time, they're going to try to enforce us to go to church on a false Sabbath. We must be well prepared for these things that is coming upon us. We must really love the Sabbath. The Sabbath needs to be a delight for us. We must enjoy when it comes, and we must hate when it leaves. Number four, the next thing that's going to come when Jesus leaves the most holy place is the great time of trouble. The Bible calls this the time of Jacob's trouble. And you remember that story when Jacob was running from his brother. Good thing that Jacob had asked for, had, you know, asked for forgiveness and he was forgiven then. But yet still, when he heard that his brother and the whole army was coming to kill him and his whole family, he was just in turmoil. He was in, look at that face. He's really in turmoil. And that's how we're going to be. We're going to be crying loud day and night, Lord, deliver us, deliver us of what is happening on this earth. And the Lord will do just that. The Lord is creative, and he loves to deliver us when it looks impossible, when it looks like we're all getting ready to seal our life with death, when it looks like that, that it's just impossible for, for uh, us to be delivered. That's when he chooses to do it, and he does not need a whole bunch of people. So when we're talking about this, the only people that's going to go Christians that's going through the time of trouble, not who's going to be saved, okay? Uh, when we look at that and we say, well, when he did Noah and it was only eight people saved, we didn't say that was symbolic, did we? We, we said, ooh, only eight people in the whole world? When he used Gideon, they started with 30,000 people, then went to 10,000, then ended up with 300. We didn't say that was symbolic, did we? No. So why do people think that that number is symbolic. Because either you're in that number or you're in the great multitude. It doesn't matter to me. I just want to go to heaven. We, we are told that we need to pray to be a part of the 144,000, but some of us, dear saints, will be laid asleep. So if all you got is 144,000 Christians when Jesus leaves the most holy place that's going through the great time of trouble, where are the other Christians? The Lord laid them to sleep. That's a beautiful thing, to be laid to sleep in the Lord. It's a beautiful thing. Because then when you wake up, all you see is the face of Jesus. That's beautiful. And some of us, we're not really physically able to go through that time. We're having a hard time going through it now. And we're not in the great time of trouble. So thank you, Jesus, for laying your people to sleep and preserving them. And thank you for the ones who will be alive when Jesus comes and will never taste death. That's a beautiful thing. Number five, we're also going to go through, which we won't linger on long, because this, for some reason this scares people. Why should this scare Christians? Unless it's going to fall on you. These are seven plagues that the Lord, they're called scourges in the Bible, that's preserved basically for those people who do not love Jesus, who are oppressing God's people. You can read about it in Revelation. You know what they are. The boils, the sun scorching the boils, the rivers turn, uh, and seas turning to blood. You know what they are. You're afraid this river drying up. You know what they are. And there are things that the Lord is 
angels will pour out upon God's people. You got that? Number six, during this time, this is the most overmastering delusion that the Bible calls it, that the spirit of prophecy calls it, is the crowning act. At this particular time, when Jesus had left the mo most holy place, when the plagues are being poured out, all this trouble is on the earth, such as it never was since a nation, then here comes Satan impersonating Christ. It says that he's going to be in dazzling brightness, a majestic form, looking just like Jesus looked, how John described it in the book of Revelation. He's going to be in different parts of the earth. Then people are going to be hollering, Jesus has come, Jesus has come. I hope it won't be any, anybody here hollering that, because we know that when Jesus comes, he's coming with thousands and thousands and thousands of angels through the star of Uriah. Everybody will see him at the same time. He will not be in different parts of the earth, and his feet will not touch the ground. If you can't remember anything, you need to remember that, so you won't be one of them few running around there like a nut talking about Jesus has come. Just read and just study, and you'll know these things. So he has this gentle, soft, subduing voice, and he heals people's diseases, we're told, from the great controversy and last day events. And he pronounces a blessing on everybody. And then he says, I just want to let you know, the reason why you're having all these, pl these plagues and everything, because there are a few people who are blaspheming my name by keeping the seventh day Sabbath, but I have changed it to Sunday. This is what he will say, okay? So this is overmastering at because the way that he's looking, the way that he's sounding, and this dazzling brightness around him. Oh, he can still work those types of miracles. But so if, you're, if we're not a student of the word, we will be deceived because we're told that if it were possible, we would be deceived. But the good thing is if it's not possible for those who study, we will not be tricked and we will know that that is not Jesus who has come. So this is the overmastering delusion, okay? And there's a set time that for all people, who honor the fourth commandment, who honor all of God's commandments, should be killed. All this is going on during that time. It's nothing worse to be after someone thinking God told you to do it. That's, that, that's a bad way, because you'll do anything. There was a movie out. I never watched it, but I heard about it. Maybe you've heard it. It was a movie that everybody had 12 hours to do exactly what they wanted to do. Do you remember that? Did you hear about it? I hope you didn't see it. It kind of reminded me of during a great time of trouble, when people will just do whatever they want to do, when the Holy Spirit will be removed from this earth, then there's nothing that's going to hold back human passion. That Satan will have complete control over the impenitent over this earth. So you got these plagues going, you got earthquakes, you got mountains and islands disappearing, you got all this stuff going. During this time, Jesus still has not come yet. And before we talk about God's wonderful deliverance, we just need to really, really pause and just ask ourselves these questions. Are we really truly, do we really love the Lord? And do we really want to be saved? Do we, really, do we really truly, because if we did, then all these little things that beset us, and they're all little, because if we miss heaven, it's over some dumb, stupid, little thing, regardless of what it may be to you. Anything is dumb. If you miss heaven, you're a dumb person. That's just, that's just the way it is. So all we're, amid all of this, this death decree and everything, that's when God chooses to deliver us. You need to really read that in the great controversy because it's actually in order. And it tells you that when God is ready to deliver you, 
the sky turns black, so black that it's thick where you can't breathe, just like the dark day in one of the plagues. But then the sun comes out. It's not an eclipse, and it's not going to look like one. The sun comes out shining in its strength, yet it's still dark. That's what makes the murderous robs the people who are trying to kill those who keep God's commandment. They look up, and they see that. That's what stops it. God's people, they also look up, but you think they're going, lo, this is our God, and we have waited for you. You think they're doing that at that time? They're just as scared as everybody else. You know in the Bible, whenever an angel talks to a prophet, the, an- the prophet is always scared, and they always lay prostrate until the angel has to say, be not afraid. So we're going to be doing the same thing because there's a lot of stuff going on during his deliverance. The great controversy and last day events in the book Maranatha, and they talk about these things. They say we look up, and then we see the sky just opening and shutting, and we see Jesus on the throne of God, and we see a hand. It's God's, the Father's hand, who's pointing to commandment number four. Now, I want to back up a second, because we're not the only ones looking at that. There was two resurrections. This is before the great multitude have risen from their grave because Jesus hasn't come yet out the sky. He's on his way, not here yet. There's a resurrection of those who pierced him, the Bible says, okay? Those who mocked him, not just the ones who physically put the spear in his side. No, if you were on the, on, against God and you were just mocking him and you just joined the crowd, crucify him, you're going to be raised up to see him come because Jesus promised that. He said, hereafter you will see me coming in the clouds of glory with thousands of angels. So they wanna, he wants to make sure that they know whom they crucified. They're going to be raised up during the seventh plague of hell that plague that leaves the sky about 50 pounds and it gets faster and faster as it comes to this earth, they're going to be raised up. Also another group, because this is the time when we're supposed to be preparing for the final test, which is whether you're going to go to church on Saturday or whether you're going to go to church on Sunday is the test. So if you've kept the Sabbath since 1844, you're coming up also in a special resurrection as a privilege to see him coming. So then there's a black, looking like a black man's fist, about the, uh, half of the size of a black man's fist, a black cloud, a little dot. And we look up and it starts getting bigger and bigger. And then we say, oh, this is Jesus. We're coming with thousands of angels. It gets bigger and brighter and brighter. He's coming. We, when he nears this earth, that's when he says to the multitudes that's in the grave, awake, awake ye that sleep in the dust. And then they come up. So what we got here, saints, we got the 144,000 that's alive. We got the, those who pierced him that came up. We got those who kept the Sabbath since 1844 came up. And now we got the multitudes, billions of them, that have come up since Adam from the grave. And then you got the rest of the wicked that's alive. And what's going to happen to them? They will be destroyed by the brightness of his coming. Their judgment is another sermon, never t- another time on July 28th. Okay. So, okay, so, so all of this is going on, and then Jesus says, awake, awake, and everybody then lifts up with the 144,000 who are alive, and all the multitudes, except for the wicked who are dead, we know that's another time, and that's when we're on our way home. We are on this earth just renting it. I don't care what, 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 what you're renting. But we're just renting down here. This is not our home. We're going to take a seven-day trip on angels' wings to our home in heaven. That is going to be something we can't even imagine. Don't even try because it says, ear have not seen, ear have not heard, nor eye seen what the Lord has prepared for those people, for us, when we go to heaven. Do you want to go or not? Okay, okay. So then, so then we get there, and then Jesus lines us up in a square, and Jesus stands, uh, uh, you know, taller than us and the angels, and with his own right hand, he puts a crown on our head. He gives us a victor's palm, and he gives us all a harp, and then he leads us to the tree of life 
because that's what we're going to be eating into eternity, folks, and we'll, we'll never, ever die when we eat from that tree of life. Just seeing Jesus, just seeing the Father, the Holy Spirit, our own guardian angel, we're even told that we can sit and talk to our guardian angel, and he's going to tell us, well, see, I, t I took you this way because of this. I had to do this because of this. Oh, that's going to be so interesting. Who would want to miss that? Why would you miss eternal life when you don't have to? Why die not in Christ when you don't have to? When he's doing everything he can possibly do to save us. Everything. He sends us the Holy Spirit. <laughs> we have our own special guardian angel. And everybody don't have that. They, they have angels, but he gave us angels and our own special one that we need to be thanking God for every single day. We have the Bible. We have the spirit of prophecy. We have our friends who help us. It just doesn't make sense. To, to not go to heaven. When we get there, ah, I gotta tell you this. There's this shriek of adoration, this loud shriek, and it's Adam. When Jesus and Adam have met again for over, what, 4,000 years? And Jesus just, arms is just outstretched, and Adam just falls into his arms. And then we're there, Looking at everybody, looking, at, we're going to see everybody. Are you going to be there or not? And then we're going to hear from God's own voice saying, Welcome home, children. A great day is coming. Heaven's gates will open wide. Those who love the Lord will enter in. Together with their loved ones who in Jesus Christ have died. One thousand years of heaven will begin. And the Lord himself will greet us. Oh, what joy will fill that day with the voice of a loving father. He looks at us to say, welcome home, children. This is the place I prepare. Have followed so 